Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so we are going to start start the second day lecture series section. Um, today we will have first uh, uh, Dr. Manitipa Banerjee, who will be talking on principles of TEM image formation. What is it? And particle detection from TEM images and noise handling. So we have swapped the uh, talks. Uh, and in, uh, after that, we will have uh, contrast transfer function, point spread function, and its effect on image acquisition and concepts of convolution and other concepts of TEM imaging. So you will have more meaningful uh, understanding of what you did in the practicals yesterday when you have these concepts understand uh, better. And uh, before we start the sessions, I would like to uh, uh, tell people that... Uh, uh, not to go to the beaches alone, okay? If you're uh, because the tides are high, it's a rainy season, okay? That's a uh, statutory warning, <laughs> and uh, and uh, we this I'm I'm sure you're all enjoying this meeting. Hope your uh, stays fine and everything is good and practicals went on well. I hope yesterday very well, and uh, all this wouldn't have been possible. Uh, for uh, without the sponsorship and event supporters. So this is uh, basically a global initiative of, of academic networks, Gyan program, which has been funded by Ministry of Human Resource Development, MHRD program. And uh, event supporters for this are MHRD Gyan and Isa Trivandrum. Uh, welcome uh, DBT India Alliance. And uh, MBO, uh, Professor Wolfgang Boymeister is coming on a global uh, EMBO lecture series, exchange lecture series. So he'll be giving a series of talks in the among uh, in the two days. He'll be here, not only in Isatrovandram, he's going to give a talk in uh, NCCS. NCCS Pune is organizing a national seminar on crystallography. So he's going to go there uh, and come here and give a talk here and also at another institute on the same day in the evening. So his uh, talk will be in Vitara campus on the 12th morning and uh, also biophysical society has been very generous uh, and we have uh, 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 bursaries for uh, around uh, 12 to 14 students uh, from biophysical society and uh, these are the event supporters and uh, we are grateful for all these people who, who have supported uh, for this event and also sponsors getan and uh, FEA and Leica have sponsored this program and, and without these sponsors and even supports this meeting wouldn't have been possible in such a beautiful location here. So uh, I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Manidipa Banerjee to deliver her talk on the principles of TEM image formation. Mic testing. Working. It's on, right? Yeah, it's on. Okay. Everyone can hear me at the back? Okay. Can you get? Can everyone hear me? Yes, it's working now. Okay, good morning. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Natesh for this uh, wonderful initiative and uh, having the first Cryom conference in India at this beautiful location. So in the, um, in the next uh, one hour, what I would try to cover would be uh, three different topics, actually. Principles of TEM image formation, particle detection from TEM images, and issues of noise and optimizing the signal-to-noise ratio. So these are topics that I will be uh, touching on mostly because they will be covered in detail in other lectures as well as in the workshops that you're doing. So uh, the CTF correction, convolutions, etc., would be covered by Steve in the next lecture. And uh, particle detection from TEM images, I'm sure when Elena goes to do 3D reconstruction, then she will cover some of that. And of course, you're doing 
uh, the workshop, so you are learning how to pick particles away from um, uh, contaminants and other things. Um, so um, again, thanks to uh, Steve's excellent lecture yesterday. I think you are now all familiar with the concepts of uh, Fourier transform and when an object is illuminated by uh, some sort of uh, light source, what you get is basically a deconstruction of the object into its uh, Fourier term, so you get a Fourier transform of the object, and then um, if you have a lens anywhere handy, then what you get is an inverse Fourier transform so that an image is formed. So this is the bas basic principle of image formation, so Fourier transform in addition to being very essential in X-ray crystallography and other techniques, is also very essential in optics. It forms the basics of image formation. So for the crystallographers in the audience, you would be familiar with uh, collecting data in diffraction space. So the difference between EM and crystallography here is that uh, because you have a lens, you are doing the inverse Fourier transform, so you're getting the phases back you don't have to do additional information in order to get the phases and then combine them with the uh, intensities to generate uh, the map. So the information is there. It's a question of extracting the information. Now, uh, when we talk about uh, electron microscopy, obviously, depending on what is uh, it that you wish to image and what sort of resolution you want to get, your um, source, um, illumination source, changes. So when you are talking about, uh, let's say, um, human hair or red blood cell or bacterium, you can do with a light microscope. Whenever you're talking in terms of a virus particle, for example, or a protein complex or a small protein, obviously you want an uh, illumination source of uh, smaller wavelength, and then you turn to electrons. So the first electron microscope was developed by Ruska in 1931. And the development of the first electron microscope owed a lot to some of the major discoveries about the properties of electrons, which happened in the early 20th century. And some of these properties are that accelerated electrons can be made to behave like light in vacuum. They can travel in straight lines. They have wave-like properties. And very importantly, uh, electric and magnetic fields could be utilized to actually manipulate these electron beams, so they could be bent, they could be focused, and the wavelength is 100,000 x uh, shorter than visible light, so this could be utilized to visualize very, very small things. So uh, this is an image of the first electron microscope, and uh, just for comparison, the resolution was uh, 100 nanometer, which is comparable to what we have for modern light microscopes these days. Now it's a current version of an electron microscope, so you can see that things have changed quite a bit. However, the basic components of the electron microscope remains more or less the same. So this is a schematic of what constitutes an electron microscope. So first off, obviously you have to have a stream of very bright, coherent electrons. So you have to have a gun, and the nature of the gun changes based on what uh, sort of magnification you want, what you actually want to do with the image. So that we'll discuss later. Now, there is a condenser lens and apertures which, whose job is to convert the diverging electron beam into a parallel beam as coherent as possible. This eventually illuminates the object of interest which you have inserted in the electron microscope. Um, eventually, um, after, and we will talk about how the, the beam basically gets uh, scattered, because we're talking about biological objects here. So uh, the scattered uh, electrons, uh, essentially, um, the initial magnification is formed by the objective lens, and there are apertures which prevent the uh, highly scattered electrons from reaching the image plane and uh, creating noise. And eventually, you also have a series of intermediate and projector lenses, which will further magnify the image, which forms in the image plane. So the overall uh, schematic of the electron microscope is basically a gun, a bunch of lenses, and some apertures, which would actually control the uh, nature of the electron beam to begin with, and the scattered beam as well. And the detection system, again, is very, uh, very important. So again, we'll come to that, whether it's a film, whether it's a CCD camera, whether it's a direct detector. 
It depends on how much information is preserved that is coming from the object. So the sources of electrons, um, as you can see here, are depicted here, the major sources of electrons. This is a tungsten filament. It could be a lanthanum hexaboride crystal or a FEG source or a field emission gun. So the tungsten filament, typically, um, it's a case of thermionic emission where the filament is heated to a very high temperature in order to uh, extract electrons. And uh, once the um, work function of the filament is exceeded, then the electrons are released. And the electrons are accelerated by, the, uh, by applying a field between anode and filament. Now, the energy distribution is fairly broad, so this is not a very coherent beam. And the magnification that can typically be achieved by a tungsten filament gun is usually between 40 to 50 kx. Lanthanum hexaboride crystals are a little bit better in the sense this is, again, thermionic emission. However, the work function is lower, so lower temperatures are required to extract electrons. And uh, this has, the source has better brightness and uh, better lifespan when compared to tungsten. It also requires higher vacuum le levels. However, as you can see, that the energy distribution is narrower, so it's a more coherent beam. And uh, the magnification, typically, which can be achieved is between 50 to 100 kx. Um, in many cases, lanthanum hexaboride sources can be used for single particle reconstruction. But typically, the, the type of images required for single particle reconstruction are generated by a FEG source. So the common FEG source is a Scott key type uh, FEG source or field emission gun source. So this is a single crystal tungsten tip which is sharpened to about uh, 10 to 25 nanometer diameter. So in comparison to lanthanum hexaboride tip, which is about, uh, let's say, in the range of micrometers. This is actually nanometers. And this is further coated with uh, zirconium dioxide, which uh, reduces the work function a bit. And the electrons are extracted by application of a strong uh, potential gradient, field emission, uh, which is thermally assisted. And the electrons that are generated are accelerated through 100 and 300 kV. So that gives rise to whether your microscope is a 100 kV microscope, whether it's a 200 kV microscope, whether it's a 300 kV microscope. And uh, this energy distribution is uh, very narrow, as you can see, compared to either tungsten or lanthanum hexaboride. This is an extremely bright source, about 500x brighter than tungsten. So this uh, very bright and coherent beam is required for single particle uh, reconstructions. And the magnification then that can be reached is more than 100 kx. Now, there is also a cold FEG source for which electrons can be extracted uh, without application of heat. And the energy distribution is better, brightness is better. However, this requires more intense maintenance. Very, very high vacuum levels have to be achieved. So most of the um, sources, uh, FEG sources that are in use, um, I imagine, are Scott key type sources, which also require very high vacuum levels. but and a lot of intense maintenance, but I guess less than what is uh, demanded by cold FEG sources. Uh, the lenses in electron microscopy, so we're not talking about optical lenses here. These are electromagnetic lenses. And uh, varying current in these coils would alter the power of the lenses, so these can be manipulated. Now, um, so in all optical microscopes, when talking about optical lenses, there are certain aberrations. I think you are familiar with the terms spherical aberration, chromatic aberration, astigmatism. So the same sort of behavior is also exhibited by the lenses in electron microscopes. So there, is, uh, there are cases of spherical aberration. Actually, this is a property of the objective lens of the electron microscope. Chromatic aberration and astigmatism. This is a perfect case um, of uh, the lens being absolutely perfect. So um, what happens in a um, spherical aberration? you essentially have a situation where the diffracted rays, which are coming from higher angle of incidence, they converge somewhere before the focal point. And uh, the correction depends on the design of the lens and the manufacture of the lens. And this is actually a very essential property. So as you will see later, this can be uh, utilized in order to gen uh, improve, uh, to some extent, contrast in the images that are generated by the electron microscope. Um, the other type of aberration is chromatic aberration, 
where uh, if you have uh, different wavelength of rays, so they would be focused differently. So as a result, what you have is sort of like a, a blurring effect, or there are colored halos, if you can see it, around your object. So you would have some blurriness which is induced in the image, which uh, causes uh, some trouble during uh, reconstructions. And this can be fixed to some extent by stable accelerating voltage. Um, and then the third type of aberration is astigmatism, which is uh, again caused by uh, one axis of the lens being stronger than the other. So what you essentially get in astigmatism, this is just a representation, is that when you're looking at a point, you basically have an ellipse. So it's just a, a difference in the way that uh, this final image is being visualized. So you just have this sort of a lengthening effect. And this is caused by asymmetric magnetic field in lenses. And to some extent, this can be compensated by using stigmata coils. So these are your guns, different types of guns for different purposes to generate electrons and lenses and the aberration in lenses. And as we'll discuss, why the aberration would become important later to generate contrast in images. So um, what happens when electrons are actually impinging on the object, which in this case is a biological material? So upon elastic collision, electrons are scattered with no change in kinetic energy. So these are more or less transmitted. However, if there is inelastic uh, collision, so uh, in these cases, a part of the kinetic energy of the electrons would be transferred to the atom. Now, this can result in ionization, this can generate free radicals, this can generate X-rays, so this can cause significant damage, plus this can contribute to noise. So, um, because these will reach the image plane later, so we're talking about uh, this, um, some sort of aberration effect, which uh, would have to be fixed for single particle reconstruction. So, um, so you have these electrons which are supposed to generate the, uh, the transmitted electrons or the elastically scattered electrons will contribute to the image and the inelastically uh, generated electrons would contribute to the noise. Now, what generates contrast in biological images? So contrast is a big problem when, whenever we are talking about biological images, um, uh, biological samples. So there are two ways that we can, we can think of contrast. There is amplitude contrast. And for understanding amplitude contrast, it is better if you think of the stream of electrons as particles. So they're hitting the object. And some of these are being absorbed. So basically what you have are gaps in the emergent waves. And then these gaps are what would generate the contrast in your image. However, when we're talking about biological samples, um, we are not talking about samples which are capable of absorbing electrons so much. So these are not very thick samples. But what they do do is alter the uh, phase of the electrons. Um, and uh, as the phase changes, or the directionali uh, directionality changes, the emergent beam, which may have different phases, would undergo constructive or destructive interference with the parallel beam. And in the image plane, that is what would generate contrast. However, again, biological samples uh, consist of very light atoms. So you have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Unless you are layering this with a heavy metal of some kind, you are essentially talking about very light atoms. And uh, these are, um, uh, it is extremely difficult to generate contrast in such samples, as you can see. It's very difficult to pick out what is there from the background. And it is essential to optimize the, the contrast as much as possible. In this case, how would you optimize phase contrast? The idea is that if you can convert the non-recordable phase contrast, so to speak, into some sort of recordable amplitude contrast, that would help quite a bit into optimizing the image. So um, how does one do that? So again, in case of uh, uh, weak phase objects, we are talking about an object which varies somewhat in the refractive index or in its thickness. And there are electron beams which are hit hitting the object. Let's say the amplitude remains more or less the same. The phase differs to some extent. 
And if you assume that the phase shift is very, very small, so then the difference, uh, the observed intensity is also going to be very, very small. However, if there is any way that we can induce an additional phase shift, it is possible that the phase change can actually be converted to, the, uh, to some sort of uh, amplitude alteration. So this is uh, more or less the basis of phase contrast microscopy. And uh, again, I don't want to go too much into complex numbers. I'm assuming most of you are familiar with complex numbers, that you can represent a wave in the form of a part of, uh, part of it in the real axis and in the imaginary axis. So the idea is that by inducing a phase shift of 90 degrees, are we able to convert some of these shifts into real recordable amplitude? Uh, difference, and that is possible upon inducing a phase shift of 90 degrees. So um, in optical microscopy, this was uh, more or less the, um, um, this, this was uh, the fundamental of phase contrast uh, configuration. Uh, so Fritz Zernike in 1934 uh, developed a phase plate which could be introduced in the back focal plane of objective lane, lens. The idea is that you have uh, the, the beam, the emergent beam, coming from the object. There may be small phase differences. There may not be amplitude differences. So the contrast may not be very recordable. However, you're trying to introduce a additional 90 degree shift. And this is what the phase plate does, uh, is that it shifts the phase of the scattered waves by an additional 90 degrees. And this converts it into some sort of recordable amplitude contrast. So you can actually see the difference. So the difference is actually fairly prominent. So if you look at, uh, this is uh, optical microscopy again, living cells in bright field versus phase contrast. So the introduction of the Zernike phase plate makes this difference that you can see this very, very nice contrast in the, in the image, which has been induced by altering the shift, um, inducing a 90 degree shift in the phases of the emergent waves. So um, the question is how to translate this into electron microscopy, right? Because that is what you want to do. You want to actually have a nice phase shift, so a recordable phase shift, so that the, um, the image um, can be uh, very nicely visualized. So actually, electron microscopy um, is phase contrast microscopy, because there are a few um, elements that are being combined to generate a phase shift of the emergent waves. So the factors that uh, one of them we've discussed is spherical aberration, and another one is defocus. So a combination of spherical aberration and defocus can be very judiciously utilized in order to generate that phase shift of 90 degree or 270 degree which would lead to the some conversion of the phase differences into some recordable amplitude contrast, which can be visualized. So the spherical aberration is already a property of the lens of the microscope. And the defocus essentially means that you are not taking the image at focus. You are taking it at a little bit of under focus. And you will see a schematic in a few minutes. So this, by a combination of these two, what we're trying to do is that we are trying to induce a effective phase shift, so to speak, so that the contrast can be improved as much as possible. And also, uh, judicious utilization of apertures, so the inelastically scattered electrons that we talked about, to prevent them from reaching the image plane so that they do not contribute to noise. So for EM image uh, collection, these are the things we are doing. Spherical aberration already is a property of the microscope that you are working with. Defocus, you can induce, so you have to figure out a, a judicious defocus, the perfect defocus, so to speak, where the phase shift can be uh, maximized. And utilization apertures to kill off the inelastically scattered electrons so that they don't actually reach the image plane. So all of these to, uh, to improve the contrast as much as possible and to reduce noise. So spherical aberration, 
Um, we already talked about this. So the diffracted rays, again, with higher angle of incidence, converge before the focal point. So again, there's a little bit of induction of the phase shift. And if you try taking images at a little bit of under focus, meaning that your sample, um, your object here, is towards the lens, so the emergent rays become divergent. And as a result, they take a little bit of time to reach the image plane. So essentially what you're doing is that you are inducing a phase shift, right? It's taking a little bit of time for the emergent waves to reach the back focal plane to eventually reach the image plane to create an image. So what you're trying to do is that you are trying to induce a phase shift. And if you have the perfect defocus value, then what you would have is that you would be able to combine the defocus with the spherical aberration in order to get a phase shift. So if you have, um, so ideally what you want is a, a defocus which would lead to a 90 degree or a 270 degree phase shift. And under these conditions, you would be able to sample a lot more of the spatial frequencies so that you have the information uh, coming from those spatial frequencies so that you're not losing out a lot of uh, information about the image. Now mathematically, this is the representation so the phase shift can be represented as a combination of the defocus and the spherical aberration and uh, given so different radial frequencies. So what we have when, when we are actually imaging, instead of um, in place of actually introducing a physical phase plate, so that also will come to, in instead of introducing a physical phase plate at the back focal plane of the objective lens, we are combining defocus and spherical collaboration together to cause a phase shift at the back focal plane. So this is what is leading to generation of contrast. Now, um, <coughs> so a combination of defocus, spherical collaboration, which is the property of the microscope, judicious utilization apertures to, re, uh, to improve contrast as much as possible. But there are a lot of uh, microscope properties, since we are talking about it, which would affect the image formation eventually. So there are conditions which are pertaining to your instrument, and then there are conditions which are environmental in origin. So what are the conditions of your instrument? There may be aberrations in the lens. There may be issues with the coherence of the source. In terms of your uh, sample, there may be uh, the quality of ice may not be great. There may be drift. There may be alterations in lens current. There may be quantum noise or short noise as the <coughs> electrons at your object. And there may be instrumental instability. There may be environmental instability. All of these will eventually affect the image that you're generating. So to think of it in perfect terms, if your microscope is perfect and the environment around your microscope is perfect, there is no instability, there are no issues, uh, there is no correction required, everything is perfect you have a small point as an object, you would expect that point to be regenerated as your image. But that is usually not the case because there are many factors which influence the formation of the image. Some of them are the properties of the microscope themselves. Now, there's a term called uh, point spread function which defines the formation of the image from the object. So the image is never perfect. It is never a perfect reproduction of your object. There are alterations which are induced. And um, so the image that you get is a combination of the object that you're trying to image and the conditions, the instrument conditions and other conditions which influence the formation of the image. So, um, so I was actually talking to Elena day before yesterday to figure out how to describe point spread function in a very non-mathematical general way. How would you say, what is a point spread function? Um, how is the inf instrument influencing the image that is being collected? So uh, she suggested that one can talk as an analogy of paint brushes, that how are your paint brush is your instrument and you have an object and the question is, how are you painting it? Are you painting it with very broad brush strokes or are you painting it with very thin brush strokes? So if you do paint with a very thin uh, brush stroke, what will, have, uh, what will happen 
is that you will preserve a lot of detail. However, in a broad brush stroke, you tend to lose some of the detail, right? It's a very general principle. So uh, since this is the, uh, the first Cryogam conference in India, I thought of using a very, very Indian analogy for this uh, paintbrush uh, thing. So I think the girls would be more familiar with what I'm showing here, right? What is this now, ladies? Mehendi. And what is that now? Rangoli. So the boys may not be that familiar, but hopefully you understand the analogy a little bit. This is painting with a very thin brush, right? And this is a very broad depiction. So you can have, depending on what uh, instrument you are using for translating your object to image, you may preserve the details or you may lose the details, right? So this is basically your point spread function. So uh, your object combined with your point spread function would eventually give you the image. So the point spread function or the PSF represents aberrations in the microscope. So it's your equipment. It's what you have to draw your object into an image, okay? And uh, again, I won't go too much into detail because Steve will be covering it in the next lecture. But if you take a convolution of your object Fourier transform with the Fourier transform of the PSF, then you generate the Fourier transform of your image. So what is the Fourier transform of the PSF? So the Fourier transform of the PSF is your CTF, or the contrast transfer function. So we've been talking about contrast transfer function earlier also. So this is where you are applying the correction. So you have used your equipment, which was probably not perfect because there were some imperfections that came into the conversion of the object to the image. Now those parameters have to be applied, so correction needs to be applied. So this is your contrast transfer function in order to ensure that some of the information should be preserved. So again, the CTF describes the imaging properties of the objective lens, and this can be used to describe the influence of factors on image quality. And uh, again, the Fourier transform <coughs> Um, of the object is a function of the Fourier transform of um, Fourier transform of the image is a function of the Fourier transform of the object, and uh, in combination with CTF and envelope functions, which again are uh, a resultant of various environmental conditions, which prevent from getting a perfect image. So uh, CTF is influenced um, by various factors. So what you see here are um, the thorn rings corresponding to uh, carbon films taken at various defocus uh, values, and this is uh, uh, astigmatic uh, image. So you can see that uh, you can tell from the um, appearance of the thorn rings that there is obviously something wrong here. And uh, the CTF, uh, as you can see, at different defocus values, you are sampling or you're losing uh, information related to different spatial frequencies. So this does act as a bandpass filter, and again, Steve will um, uh, expand on that, that um, one has to try to improve, uh, utilize various uh, different conditions to ensure that all of these spatial frequencies, or as, as much as possible, is being sampled. So this is the CTF of a 300 kV TEM, which is close to the optimum defocus, uh, uh, optimum defocus, and uh, you can see that uh, all spatial frequencies may not be sampled at a certain defocus value. So images have to be collected at different defocus values in order to get all the information related to a particular uh, image, a uh, particular object. And uh, the point at which the function first hits the x-axis is the point resolution. And obviously, the, the idea is to improve this as much as possible. Now, um, having spoken about uh, microscope properties a little bit, um, when we're trying to image biological samples, um, we are trying to preserve as much information as possible. And because uh, hitting elect uh, biological samples with electrons generate a uh, lot of uh, sample damage, um, all of these uh, images are collected at low dose mode. 
meaning that the electron dose typically is very, very low of the order of, let's say, 5 to 20 electrons per angstrom square. And as a result, the signal to noise ratio is very, very low. So you're taking the, uh, collecting the data in the low dose mode, and you can see it's very difficult to tell the objects. So what can one do? So this is what we're talking about to generate contrast. But what can one do to further improve the contrast and to increase the signal to noise ratio? So there are various things which can be done at the sample level, at the microscope level, and at the data collection level. So we'll discuss each one of them in turn. So if uh, you um, um, went to Dr. Natisha's talk yesterday, so he's talking about negative staining as well as uh, cryo, uh, uh, <coughs> cryo freezing of samples. Now a combination of the two at the sample level which can be done to improve contrast is called cryo-negative staining. So you're familiar with the principle of negative staining, which is that um, you basically encase the sample in uh, some sort of a heavy metal salt, which uh, absorbs electrons fairly easily. And the heavy metal salts that are typically used are uranium, tungsten, molybdenum, vanadium, lead. And what you can see here are some um, negative stain EM images of one of the viruses that we work with. So you can see that the contrast is really, really good. The problem here, obviously, is that you're dehydrating the sample because a drying step is required for negative staining. And this certainly causes dehydration-related damage. This results in the formation of artifacts. And you can just see the very basic broad surface features. You can't actually see the finer details eventually. So one can try to do a low-resolution reconstruction from here, but it's typically not very good. Now, if, um, if it's very difficult to visualize samples after they have been frozen in vitreous ice, it may be possible to incorporate just a little bit of stain in order to improve the signal-to-noise ratio, um, signal ratio contrast a little bit. And uh, the prevalent method for this uh, cryonegative staining was developed by Mark Adrian, published in 1998. So uh, the, the typical method is that you take a grid and you add a thin la layer of uh, a metal, gold or palladium, on one side of the grid, which allows the sample to spread. And then you take this grid and you add it to a slurry of ammonium molybdate, which is a staining solution. So you take a drop of ammonium molybdate on a paraffin, if you're familiar with the, the staining process. You dip your grid in there and you, you have to dry it. So you quick dry it for one to three seconds. Now, this is not a typical cryo method because you should not be drying anything, uh, obviously. And after drying for one to three seconds, you take it to plunge freezing. So you're expecting some dehydration, obviously, but uh, the thought is that uh, there is still enough water left after this little one to three seconds of drying, which would still cause the formation of vitreous ice except that you have now this uh, sort of uh, ammonium molybdate to uh, delineate where your particle is. So I'll just show you a um, couple of examples from a paper published in 2011. So um, <coughs> this is the structure of Groyel, which is salt with just a cryo um, freezing technique and then cryo negative stain. So the concern was that uh, whether you would see a lot of dehydration in the cryonegative staining. So what the authors claim is that they see the particles in the microscope, uh, in the image, very nicely shadowed. And when they carry out the reconstruction, the reconstruction does not look significantly different from the reconstruction generated uh, by uh, freezing the samples in vitreous size. And they also claim that this can be uh, carried out with fewer number of samples, a fewer number of particles, just because the contrast is higher. Right? So this is just uh, frozen with and without stain. And also another example of uh, RNA polymerase, which uh, is, uh, again, shadowed with ammonium molybdate for cryonegative staining. And the structure is salt. And it is possible to fit in. It was possible to fit in the um, crystal structure nicely. So again, the point is that the structure isn't altered so much as a result of shadowing the particles with negative stain. So then, this is at the sample level, 
one method for improving the uh, uh, contrast a little bit. Now at the microscope level, what can one do additionally to improve the contrast? So as we discussed, we, we are doing phase contrast microscopy when we're doing electron microscopy because we're using a judicious combination of defocus and the spherical collaboration of the microscope to generate some sort of phase shift in the emergent electrons. But it may be possible to have, and it is possible, to have a physical phase plate introduced in the back focal plane of the uh, microscope which would induce a 90 degree phase shift in the emergent electrons. So this, if you remember Professor Wachu's talk uh, day before yesterday, he, when he was uh, presenting his uh, data on cryo-electron tomography, the data was collected on a microscope which was with a, fitted with a face plate. So this is this uh, Zernike uh, face plate and you can see um, as an example, difference in contrast in absence of face plate and in presence of face plate. So uh, the invisible phase contrast uh, has been converted into recordable amplitude contrast by shifting the phase of the scattered electrons by 90 degrees. This is a physical entity which is introduced in the back focal plane of the microscope. So again, just to show you uh, one example from a published paper, this again is a bacteriophage, um, I think this is T4 bacteriophage in cells, and uh, this uh, is without having a face plate, and this uh, image is with having a face plate. So you can see definitely the contrast has improved drastically. Now this uh, is, uh, the face plate is definitely essential for um, dealing with, uh, I think, tomography, cryo-electron tomography, when you're looking at cellular sections, things that are a little bit uh, too thick, perhaps, and um, which can definitely produce an improvement uh, significant improvement in contrast. Um, now, um, another way of uh, ensuring that uh, you are improving the, um, reducing the noise and improving the SNR as much as possible is to use energy filtering. So again, this is something that one does when uh, by controlling the aperture, so you're trying to prevent the elastically scattered electrons from reaching the image plane. But this is not always 100% successful. So you can remove inelastically scattered electrons by introducing uh, an energy filtering device either in column or post column. So the in column filtering device is called, uh, uh, it's called an omega filter and uh, this is what it looks like. So you're basically just removing the inelastically in scattered electrons to reduce noise as much as possible. And this can also exist post-column. So you can, use, you can have either in-column or post-column energy filters. And the idea is to remove the inelastically scattered electrons, which might produce blurriness in the image or noise in the image. Um, so again, to show you an example, these are actin filaments, which have been imaged using an omega type energy filter. And uh, the images are relatively much, much clearer as you would uh, have without having uh, uh, an energy filter in the same getup. And the authors claim that they have a five fold improvement in, um, in the <coughs> contrast um, upon using an omega type energy filter. So in addition to in these, uh, these uh, things which can be added to the microscope for improved uh, contrast, there is the face plate, there is the omega filter, um, or the post column filter. Uh, there are other things which people do as a matter of routine, which is the controlling the apertures to ensure that you cut off the elastically scattered electrons, collecting images at different defocus values to ensure that you get more contrast, now this is one example which has uh, been a problem for me, it's a, a research problem for the last uh, six years or so. So we have been trying to look at uh, a virus which is at the point of um, disassembly. So what we're looking for, what we're trying to trap is a virus which is just about to release its RNA. We don't want an empty particle, we don't want a full particle, we want something which is just at the point of releasing RNA, so we can tell how the RNA is coming out of the virus. So uh, if you see here, so this is at uh, 
These two are at different defocus values. So at the higher defocus, what you can see is at least we can try to identify some of these particles which seem to have this little bit of this uh, puff, so to speak. These are, uh, population of these are called puffed particles, and these have been characterized biochemically. It's very difficult to just uh, try to get a structure. So um, at least at higher defocus, we can see, we can have enough contrast that we can see that this little bit of puff that is coming out of the particles. And uh, then the challenge is whether we can have enough of these puffed particles in order to do an asymmetric reconstruction. But changing the focus does change contrast. And uh, then, the, then the last thing is, um, well, to improve contrast and improve SNR, um, um, one can do cryonegative staining at the sample level. At the microscope level, one can play with aperture size defocus or introduce a face plate or energy filter in the, um, in the microscope. Now at the data collection level as well, um, one can use different, um, uh, different types of detectors. So the direct detector, which would um, eliminate, uh, which would uh, improve drastically the signal to noise ratio as well as automated collection techniques. So the detection system, which was previously in use and now also in use in many places, is a CCD camera. And a CCD camera is a multi-step conversion of the incident electrons into, eventually into readouts. The incident electrons are converted to photons, photons generate electric charge, charge is converted to pixel for readout. So you're doing a multi-step conversion of the incident electrons so that you're getting an image readout. Now the direct detector uh, technology does away with uh, this uh, sort of multi-step conversion. The whole point of a direct detector is that you're directly detecting the incident electrons. And obviously it required uh, the generation again of um, media which uh, is um, um, tolerant of, the, uh, of directly interacting with uh, electrons and generating the images. So um, another important thing is that uh, it is possible to correct for beam-induced movement by doing subframe alignments because the images can be collected in the movie mode to improve the contrast quite a bit. So this is an example with rotavirus, um, double-layered rotavirus particles. So these are images without alignment and this is uh, images with subframe alignment. So you can see that definitely the contrast is fairly improved. Now, um, the last thing that I'm going to uh, talk about in uh, improving signal to noise. So you may have uh, you know, particles which are not at high contrast and there may be other issues, but if you collect enough particles, if you collect a large enough number of particles, you can try to improve the signal to noise ratio fairly well. And this is a little difficult to do in uh, manual operation. So when you are talking about in modern day uh, structure uh, 3D reconstructions that you are collecting 170,000 um, particle images or a million particle images. So it's very difficult to do that via manual techniques because you would be searching for areas for imaging, then setting the lens, uh, the, setting the stage movement, low dose operation, then you collect the data set. So these uh, can be automated and uh, uh, all of these operations that are mentioned here can be automated, including basic image Fourier transforms, which are then co cross-correlated with the manually collected images, and that is how the automated program knows that it's collecting real particles and uh, not basically noise. And uh, as a result of these repetitive operations becoming automated, it is possible to collect large data sets. So uh, one of the earlier ones was Legionon, which uh, is um, free uh, from NRAM, and the other uh, ones are EPU for FEI. So these are all automated data collection softwares, which can be utilized for collecting large amounts of data. So, um, so the last part then of my talk is uh, once you have optimized signal, uh, contrast and you have collected enough particles uh, and you have optimized, hope to optimize the signal to noise ratio eventually, how do you actually recognize these particles? So how do you pick the particles? So manual picking is, uh, 
is not feasible when you are talking about, again, a one million particle data set or even a 100,000 particle data set. So how does one go and pick these particles? So uh, particle picking, um, one has to ensure, and as you were learning in your workshops as well, that you don't want to pick the junk, you want to pick what are good particles, which are nicely separated from each other, so that uh, you eventually you can do a decent reconstruction. So uh, you will be learning how the particle picking process happens in Eman and in Reliant, but I'll just give a very brief primer about what is the basic method for particle picking. So one of the earlier methods which was developed was template matching. So you have your particles in your image, and you're initially collecting some, uh, picking some particles manually. So you're providing the program with a template. And that template is cross-correlated by various methods to match with specific images, uh, specific particles in your image, which are then picked. Now, the problem here is that, uh, again, uh, going to 3D reconstruction a little bit, you want random orientations of your particles because you want to sample all different projections in order to get a decent reconstruction. So if you just look at this letter A, if you just turn the letter A in various ways, it is very difficult to actually match, for example, this with this, right? They don't look similar. So template matching would only work properly if you are using a rotationally averaged reference. So your reference image that you are using or should be a cluster of 2D projections so that they match with all the random orientations of the particles which can be picked. And this is also sensitive to variations in spatial frequency because uh, spatial frequency would alter you know, what are the details you see and what are the details you may not see. And this might uh, affect the cross-correlation as well. Another method is edge detection. So here, you are, you are trying to locate the outlines of the blobs in these images. So what you have are these particles, and you're looking at the outlines of these particles, and you're trying to see whether that makes sense in terms of what you are trying to pick. So, <laughs> so uh, this, again, is somewhat insensitive to spatial frequency because the particle, you may have missed some of the, the, the data corresponding to certain spatial frequencies, but the overall boundary would remain more or less the same, so you can use edge detection to pick particles. Couple other methods are intensity comparisons. So here you choose objects with uniform internal density and you do horizontal vertical scan to identify these clusters. And uh, there are obviously post-processing checks to get rid of uh, uh, false positives or false negatives. And uh, there can also be texture-based methods which compute local variance over small areas. And high values of local variance indicate presence of object. However, this also has a propensity to choose for aggregates or contaminants. So typically what, uh, what I'm trying to say is that there are many automated methods for particle picking, and typically they are very good. If you have uh, a decent image set, it is fairly easy to pick particles. If there is heterogeneity in your, uh, in your material, so you have a population of particles which bind ligand and a population which do not bind ligand. So this heterogeneity, again, can be sorted out computationally at the stage of 2D classification. And this will, again, be discussed in greater detail. The challenge is also to get rid of, uh, if you have a, a data set with a lot of contaminations, or in this case, as you can see, there are a lot of broken particles, then one has to use a judicious mixture of automated and manual methods. So it's basically a semi-automated method so that you get decent particles. Or in cases where the particles are very, very hard to identify, then some manual intervention might be necessary. But overall, all the particle picking techniques are fairly automated and they work very well. And you will learn them during your workshop in Eman and Rely. So um, with this, I think I will end. And if there are any questions, I'm very happy to answer. Or I can direct them to Steve. <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks, Manideepa. Very nice talk. Uh, just a few.
few questions regarding uh, right uh, initially uh, i wanted to uh, first question rega uh, with regards to you had showed that there will be some amount of phase shift when the beam goes from the uh, sample to the forming the projection uh, you showed that there will be a little bit of a phase shift in one of your images right uh, you know uh, i mean we sort of know that there is really no loss of phase uh, in electron microscopy so how much is this phase shift that you're referring to so the phase shift is what is uh, so is phase shift in the emergent uh, wave in the sense that uh, you may have a sample so you're looking at the sample in terms of thickness right so the thickness in different areas are varying so uh, as a result uh, you are seeing a little bit difference in the uh, emergent wave in terms of phase and that is what eventually will generate contrast so you want to maximize the phase shift so the phase shift is very very small obviously mm -hmm. and that is what needs to be maximized by utilization of uh, these uh, things which are inherent in the in the microscope um, um, like uh, you're using defocus or uh, altering defocus or using spherical collaboration uh, or let's say um, exploiting the spherical collaboration to um, to imp to increase this as much as possible so you can see the contrast in the in the eventual image but uh, if again uh, the face plate also does a similar thing that it alters the uh, it induces a shift of 90 degrees sure. so um, so you can improve that uh, contrast even further and uh, the second thing concerning the electron beam itself mm -hmm. uh, usually uh, through the whole path of the electron beam what is the kind of divergence that you see uh, particularly with a uh, feg uh, i'm sure it must be the smallest but yeah it's not i mean the whole idea of having feg source is that it's very very coherent so the energy distribution is very narrow mm -hmm. so the idea is that you already have a very convergent beam and it can be made to um, it can be this uh, convergence can be further helped by using the condenser lens and okay. again uh, changing the aperture a little bit okay. uh, which becomes a big problem when you are dealing with let's say a tungsten source or a lab six source so there are examples where people have done single particle reconstruction there are many examples with a lab six source but then you are dealing with a beam which is not as coherent right. or as bright as FEG. Right. So FEG definitely has the advantage. Yeah. In terms of uh, I mean, th which leads to my next question. One of the aspects about the whole spherical collaboration is the lens not being a perfect lens. Right. And, uh, but then there are an array of lenses in the microscope. So which lens are we talking about with regards to the spherical collaboration? So we're talking about the objective lens mostly. Yeah. So no. it, is the, it is mostly the characteristics of the objective lens which mm -hmm. will eventually decide the, the okay. image formation. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so one of the other aspects about the, lens, uh, the spherical aberration and the defocus was that they are sort of interrelated, are they, or am I getting it wrong? Well, uh, I mean, you have to have, I guess, I think Elena would be able to answer this better. A uh, combination. Uh, yeah, so uh, the spherical aberration and the defocus are uh, jointly used to create an, uh, uh, the best contrast possible in the absence of a face plate. Uh, so, for instance, if you have a perfect lens which converges at a, you know, there is no spherical aberration, uh, what would, would you still de uh, put, a, put the sample at a defocus level? Or? In this case, when you are defocused, is that what was? Uh, could you please go to the slide mm -hmm. by Marine Van Hill? Yes. You have for the from his. Yes. You have a very lovely slide. Sorry. It's okay. Ah. The the previous this one. Do you have? There is a photo. Yeah. When you have a perfect lens, no spherical aberration in the lens by itself, then the wave front, uh, front of the minute came in the center and these deviations are in phase. And they're flat, and because here we don't have any amplitude contrast, no electrons they have been absorbed, really you have nearly no contrast whatsoever. 
it's a point when you're doing defocusing. Is that what you're doing in the microscope? The, the central beam, which goes through the very center and focus, it's still flat. But these uh, deflected beams, they're slightly, that's what was Marin is trying to show. It would be the difference, and here mostly, this is the difference, deviation. It creates some sort of interference pattern. And because when you have more defocus, it will be more difference in the phases. Therefore, you create an extra de uh, interference here, and that's a, if you remember the um, CTF function, when you have close to defocus, it goes like that. But if it's far from focus, it goes like that and emphasize low frequencies. In general, it's mostly the defocus delta Z if you are coming to the description of the contrast and the, do you have this? You ha yes, you have. Next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> you have everything, <laughs> nice yeah. talk. Uh, 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 when you have the formula for the contrast, this one. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, this one. That's exactly. It's one story, the uh, con uh, spherical contra uh, spherical aberrations. But defocus here, where is it? Defocus, this one, delta, this one. This is a slightly different parameters. It's not related to the aberrations. It by itself changes the wave front which came through the lens. It's two independent parameters. So the spherical aberration is a property. <laughs> Thank you. So the spherical aberration is a property of the instrument that you're working with, obviously. But the defocus is something that you're fiddling with to uh, improve. Yeah, the, yeah, that is in your hands, but the other thing isn't. Is this working? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I'm kind of uh, getting confused. If we have defocus. Uh, do we really compromise resolution if we do too much of defocus? Do we compromise Structural resolution, resolution that what you're getting eventually. So, you're so are you losing some kind of, yeah. So you're improving contrast. If we are just improving contrast, but will yeah. it affect your resolution as well? So like with the, the, the even, even you're uh, taking this, so that is why, you know, you have to have different defocus values at which you are calculating the CTF, right? So uh, you basically want to uh, have, uh, you know, uh, sample as many spatial frequencies as possible, as you can see in your CTF curve with different defoc and I think Steve will talk about it, at different defocus values, where, um, you know, if the defocus is, uh, let's say, at different values of defocus, you will get different um, representations of your CTF uh, uh, contrast transfer function. And you will see that you are, you know, sampling some spatial frequencies in case of some defocus values, and you are you are losing some information. So wherever that you know the CTF curve goes up and down, so wherever it is hitting zero, you are losing the information coming from that spatial frequency, right? So to answer your question, yes, you can lose information, but the idea is to optimize it as much as possible. So when you're working at the optimal defocus, that's when you have maximum information. Okay. About it. Thank you. Um, uh, is it possible to have uh, chromatic aberrations in electron microscopy because uh, all the images that, that are forming are black and white? So is it possible to have chroma well, <laughs> chromatic aberrations? That's a good question. So it's basically what when you see your image as uh, being fairly blurry, right? So it's possible in the sense that uh, what happens in chromatic aberration is that you have, uh, uh, when you have electrons at different wavelengths, right? So they are creating this halo or they're creating a noise in your, in your sample. So you can think of it as when you have a lot of inelastically scattered electrons, right? So they're slowed down, they have different wavelength, and when they're combining to form the image, then you have this blurriness around your image. So, uh, won't so that would be. So won't this problem be solved uh, if we ha if we use just electrons of just one wavelength? Well, uh, of course. I mean, that's what you're. Look, you are mixing up 
the question of chromatic aberrations, it's not always, first of all, the color. The beam is nearly coherent, but when we are talking of the fact and what she wants to try to tell you, blurness, it means a small discrepancy in coherence. It doesn't go like it changes in color, like in a photograph. I think the confusion was that initially that I showed that uh, image with the color uh, because I, I was trying to draw a parallel from optical microscopy. In microscope, we do have chromatic aberrations, and we don't like them. <laughs> but the point that the range of, uh, how to say, discrepancy in wavelengths, it's quite small, but it affects high frequencies and affects our high resolution. But the, be the image doesn't become in color. <laughs> Since it's the range of, the, it's like, for example, to, to make it the more clear. For example, laser pointer. It means you suppose that it's completely coherent, but it's a small, small range of different gray wavelengths. Possibly by your eye, you're not able to see that. But in practice, it's really, it's not absolutely one single wavelength. It's a small range, but you can see that and when you're talking of the high, small details. Both relating to the face, so they showed various methods which you can increase the contrast, uh, example the face plate and this one. So is it possible to combine these or com combination will only affect? Uh, no, absolutely. I mean, you can have a microscope, I'm certain, with the face plate and an uh, omega filter and hmm. uh, that can definitely improve uh, improve uh, the contrast quite a bit. Okay. And a second question, is there any particular advantage or disadvantage of uh, in-column versus the post-column energy filters? Uh, yeah, the in-column is supposed to be better because it's doing a better job of cutting off inelastically scattered electrons versus the post-column. But uh, I don't know, so this one question I also have that I don't know if it's possible to retrofit a microscope uh, with a uh, face plate or uh, and uh, you know some sort of an energy filter. So that is something that I'm also trying to find out. Oh, thank you for the nice talk. I have one question about the uh, one we mentioned about the optimized focus condition. What's the optimized focus condition for taking a cryo image? Since uh, yes, it maybe it's a very what, basic what question. What is the optimized focus condition? The focus condition, like uh, you show image like a micron uh, negative my one micron. No, so you're supposed to take uh, images at various defocus conditions because where you, I mean, you might be, uh, what you want to do is to uh, get uh, as much. Okay, all right, then. Fine, I'll, I'll, I'll defer so the question. So I will, I will get in. in the next talk, I'll talk about that for one. Okay, so, so thank you. So. Uh, my question is related to defocus again. Uh, in one of your slides, there, uh, there is the next talk. It's completely about defocus. But go ahead. Yeah, thank you. In one of your slides, uh -huh. uh, you compare two micrographs with different defocus, right? Different defocus. Uh, minus one and minus six, I guess. Yes. Let me go there. Yeah, this one. Right. On the left side, uh, you see lower contrast with mm -hmm. lower defocus. Mm -hmm. On the right, uh, image uh, with higher defocus, and it improves contrast. Right. Uh, on the other hand, limitation is, of course, you uh, th there is lower resolution. Right. But how does it affect for smaller molecules? How, small, how uh, lower the defocus can be for smaller molecules? when you deal with the 200 to 50 kilo daltons? Uh, that is something that I don't think I'm able to address. I think Elena would be able to address that. In general, nowadays, first of all, we are in a rush. We don't have to collect data with all kind of numbers defocuses. And the focus is very much depend on the, for example, size of the molecule. There's for a, from my perspective, and one micron defocus. I cannot complain. From my perspective, it's absolutely amazing, lovely contrast. You can see every particles, and if you want to see if the RNA is 
running out, I would do just low pass filtering. I would not bother about the minus six micron. But if you have small molecules, like for example, 150 kilodaltons, 100 kilodaltons, it's another story. You cannot see them at all at one micron defocus. Typically, you are taking images at, for Three. example, minus eight, minus 12 micron. It's really highly defocused to see these blobs and then you have to spend time on CTF correction. I do believe Steve will spend quite a lot of time to explain all this, or at least he mentioned how to deal with it. It's a really tricky issue to work with the small molecules. And if you remember, I have mentioned that when Juan was giving a talk, that here, face plate, especially water plate, Make, uh, gives us a lot of opportunities to take images more close to focus and to improve the contrast when we're just using faceplate, when we're changing the phases. So to actually add some uh, visual data to what Elena said, I'll just show you the last slide where you can kind of see a very small molecule that we're working with. And this is very highly defocused. So um, this is, well, viruses don't, or larger macromolecules don't require that kind of defocus. But uh, these are extremely defocused, so we can actually see these uh, very small proteins. These are about, I think, 200, 210 KDs, right? So, um, so it has to be optimized, obviously. And uh, it's, uh, you have to fiddle with the defocus conditions to figure out something that gives you the best contrast. Uh. One more. Uh, apart from the face plates, uh, Selena mentioned, hmm. uh, is cryonegative staining a possible option for this? So uh, that's, again, uh, a good question in the sense that, uh, so uh, there, there are claims in literature that you can actually use uh, cryonegative staining to, um, you know, uh, sort of um, delineate the the particles so that you can see it better, improved contrast. So you can actually uh, use a smaller number of particles for a reconstruction, which is just as good or maybe a little bit uh, worse than a regular cryo reconstruction. But that concern is always there. That, so the process is fairly uh, convoluted, if I can use that word, because you have to uh, just uh, ensure that you're not drying out your sample and uh, immediately pl plunge freezing it so that uh, there is a little bit of water still left around so that you can get uh, that, uh, you know, the uh, nice vitreous ice um, after freezing. So the technique and eventually whether it would lead to some dehydration or not, how it would affect your structure that you are working with, because all proteins are different, right? So that, those considerations are, are definitely there. Thank you. Good. If uh, there are no more questions, uh, I would like to thank uh, Mani Deepa for giving a very nice talk on the and particle information and noise handling. I want you to come in the middle because the, the cameraman has directed me to do this. Thank you. Thank you.